India's Foreign Intelligence Service thinks Canada's internal security is a joke. As long as Justin Trudeau is in power, they will continue to push Canada around. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. Canada's Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security is meeting to talk about the foreign influence from India specifically in this in this meeting. They brought a security specialist in, and he is talking specifically about the Indian Foreign, Ga- foreign Intelligence Gathering Service, which is known as RAW. We're going to be talking about how Canada is lacking in so many facets of its national security that other countries think it's a joke, that they're not even worried about what Canada can do to them. Um, I'd like to use my time uh, to provide some insights into the role of India's Foreign Intelligence Service in the conduct of covert operations abroad. The name of that service is the Research and Analysis Wing, or RAW. It operates from within the Prime Minister's office, is subject to direction from the Prime Minister's National Security Advisor, and is not publicly or judicially accountable for its actions. It was significantly reformed and founded as RAW in 1968. But from the late 1980s, RAW began to turn its attention to a different sort of perceived enemy, advocates of the Khalistan separatist movement. I may do a a video on the Cal Stan movement. I'm still pulling together some of the uh, dates and stuff. What we want to hear from that opening is that this foreign intelligence service has been under this particular name since 1968, and Canada doesn't even have one. So this RAW is, uh, you know, you might hear it as the CIA. It's a foreign intelligence gathering, and it works directly for the prime minister's office. RAW posts officers under diplomatic cover to Indian embassies and consulates abroad. The power that RAW possesses as an independent arm of the Prime Minister's conduct of global diplomacy gives its sway over India's diplomatic corps and means it means that it can deploy India's foreign ministry officials as dutiful instruments in intelligence collection and the support for the conduct of covert operations. RAW, in my view, has joined the ranks of the Russian SVR and FSB and the Chinese MSS as posing a critical national security threat to Canada. What he said there was that the they post these RAW fellows in the embassy and then those guys have the ability or the power to tell those ambassadors and all of their support staff. I don't imagine the ambassador per se or the high commission or whatever it is they, they're calling them from India, but any of the support staff, these Individuals have the right to um, enlist and get them to gather information that they then can give back to the raw representative that's in the uh, embassy. He also put them on par with China, China's Foreign Intelligence Gathering Service and Russia's Foreign Intelligence Gathering Service, which of course would put them in the same field as America's Foreign Intelligence Gathering Service. So this is not a joke. To have these guys running up and down the country is probably something that we should be looking at. But as I say that, don't think for one second that there aren't a dozen countries treating us with the same disrespect and the same contempt. Let's be straightforward. We don't even have a foreign intelligence gathering service. The activities of RAW in Canada require a strong counterintelligence response to identify RAW officials, monitor their activities, and disrupt them whenever possible. We don't even have a branch that does that. Like I say, we have CSIS and we have the RCMP who are understaffed, underfunded, and honestly, up to this point, probably not even looking at India. They're probably looking specifically at other countries that might, you know, Iran, Iraq, those kinds of places. And as a country that's not even putting it very little, that puts no money into its national security, we can see that the, the way that we have to address this is a top-down problem the most powerful countries in the world are probably running all around our major cities. It's a good question, um, Ms. Dancho, and I, th- I thank you for it. Uh, you know, I think there are two things at play here. One is that India believes that it can be more muscular in its approach to Canada and, as you say, brush us off and, and, and frankly, treat uh, senior Canadian officials with um, extraordinary degrees of contempt. Um, uh, they believe simply that they have the power to do that. Um, they, they are in a, an embarrassing position, I would say, with regard to the United States, in 
terms of having been forced by the U.S. to agree to an investigation into covert operations conducted uh, ag against American citizens. They would um, like to be able to treat Canada differently, um, so bend to the United States, not bend to Canada as a way of, uh, frankly, saving face. I believe that. I believe that the Americans have a whole cadre of individuals who are patriots and they are born, you know, their, their ancestors might come from India themselves, but they see themselves not as Indians. They see themselves as Americans. Now that's a problem we have in Canada. We have too many people here who think that they want to be from somewhere else. And our federal government fans those flames so that everybody can be divided so that they can keep the economy terrible and yet still get elected. They have nothing but contempt for our politicians because our politicians, quite frankly, give them that opportunity. Now, you can rest assured that they're not going to be treating, you know, the CIA or the FBI in the way that they're mistreating the RCMP or the CSIS. Um, but a recognition, I think, on the part of, of India that both Britain and Germany are, in many respects, significant powers in ways that Canada is not in their eyes. So uh, they, they have seen, certainly in the past, Canada as a power that they can push around uh, on the global stage and a power that it makes sense for them in terms of domestic politics and their official line that, that you know, successive Canadian governments ne never take seriously their concerns about uh, violent extremism abroad targeting their country. Uh, they've made Canada, frankly, a, a bit of a target. So first, on the one hand, they think that Germany and Britain and other countries like that have serious counterintelligence apparatus that will, if not punish them, certainly catch them and be aware of the problem. Canada doesn't have all of that. And Canada is not in a position to push back, so they think that we are a joke. This foreign intelligence expert is saying flat out that you know India is basically having free reign all over this country, that the Prime Minister of India is worried about diaspora performing actions of, in his words, violent actions in, in the country of, of India. And we as Canadians do not have any counter to it. We don't have a branch or a, a policing security service that is like, hey, we're going to put these to stop. I mean, from the security experts' own words, I mean, we release six people, but India probably has 12 or 20. I mean, for, think of the idea that we are aware that there are 175 such individuals in China, excuse me, 175 Chinese diplomats. So imagine, you know, that countries just put in as many as they want and they are just very selective or they leave them there and then they activate them when something like this goes on. So the second that those six people left the country, they were prob there was probably six more who were tapped to begin, who had been doing nothing but their daily routine. And then oh, they got the tap because now the, their, the guy that was out in front as the um, spy was sent back to India or was kicked out of the country nonetheless. And we, in this committee, hear how India doesn't have any concerns or worries about the counterintelligence service of Canada, which, of course, is a joke, right? It's a contemptuous idea because we allow for it to be that way, because we want to run around telling ourselves that we can all just go kumbaya, that every country in the world is not running around all over the place. How do we, how do we hope to have individuals identify as being Canadian if every time somebody from their own foreign country just feels like it, they can simply reach out and knock on their door and there's no security, there's no safety. In America, they have that security, they have that safety, and they can develop that loyalty to the country that they are in. They can develop the idea of the identity of being an American. You know, I, I think a lot of our Five Eyes partners would like to see Canada do more, frankly, and, and this has been expressed from time to time, um, particularly in, in terms of certain kinds of capacities to collect intelligence globally. There have been, from time to time, criticisms directed at Canada that we do not have, for example, a foreign intelligence service, unlike all of our other Five Eyes partners. But I do take issue when we get criticisms from, from security officials around the world calling Canada a free rider, whether it's on defense or intelligence gathering. And so just with my few seconds, 
seconds, just uh, more advice from you of what Canada can be doing to elevate our position uh, to support us from being, in, in essence, bullied by foreign countries. Again, I think um, a tougher diplomatic response to various forms of Indian aggression um, and a, a more robust capability, especially I would come back to the question of uh, how well positioned are we really to conduct significant penetrating counterintelligence operations uh, against Indian officials in Canada. We have, we have the laws to, to allow us to do that, uh, but CSIS as an organization these days is overstretched. The RCMP is certainly and um, India would never have been regarded as a, a principal counterintelligence mission for the Canadian community until recently. So he says that the, the people that are our allies think that we're, or she said that we were, you know, going on a free ride because we have no, we don't put any investment in foreign intelligence services and we don't put any investment in counterintelligence. And what um, we do have is the RCMP and CSIS, who of course are spread really thin, especially the RCMP who has in addition to being the uh i mean they have a lot of they wear a lot of hats in the rcmp at least we can say that CSIS is designed for that specific avenue whereas the rcmp there are rcmp officers right now pulling people over in their car to kind of thing like they have a lot they have a very wide mandate and i believe that we should be sort of taking some of their mandate away from them and allowing them with the same amount of resources and with the same amount of people to focus solely on a few other domestic issues that we should be having a foreign intelligence service that rivals the rest of the world how do we have them as canadian first when they're all, when they're you know when iraq can send the national guard what do they call that the revolutionary guard right into your apartment building and knock on the door and tell you that they saw you walking around without a hijab and as a result it's going to be trouble or if we can have china come over here and tell people who to vote for and bust people in blatantly right out in front, like without even worrying about it, just bust them in and have them vote for people. All right, so as many of you are probably aware, when we are listening to these committees, I listen to the Liberal Party, but I don't necessarily include them. I listen to all the rounds. It takes some time sometimes. So here we have an individual who sits down in the room, and he says that India thinks we're a joke. He says that our, our allies think that we do not contribute enough to the security of the, of the world. We have no foreign intelligence gathering service. He, thinks, he said that India doesn't have any fear or concern of retaliation from Canada for these actions that they're performing inside of the country. He says all of this and much more. You heard him say it. And so now it's the liberal six minutes, right? And it's the first time they're getting their six minutes. And you would think this law and order government, this government who who everybody knows has at least 11 people inside of it that are working for foreign governments that are actively or passively forwarding the motion, the, the betterment of other countries over our own. In this one, I want you to concentrate on the idea that the liberals get a turn. Here they are. We got all of these revelations from the security individual. We're talking about how India has, you know, a, attacked people on Canadian soil and all of this list of things that we, you know, that you may have heard from. So you would think that the liberals are going to be coming out saying, hey, how can we fix this? How, what can we do? How much money do you think it would cost to get it off the ground? Right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to both of our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Mr. Work, I said to you, you need a frequent flyer card for the number of times you come to this committee over the years. Mm -hmm. um, my first question is to both of you, and it's a fairly simple one. Do you think all of the leaders in the House should get a uh, top secret security clearance to get briefings on uh, this issue and any others that impact the national security of the country? Now, I'll be honest with you. When I saw that, there was some colorful language that came out of my mouth. I don't, you know, say much swearing in these videos. I don't say any, I think. But I, <laughs> I do have the ability. And I promise you that we got all of this national security problem bearing down on us. And the Liberal Party is trying to get some random expert to say that we should get Pierre Polyev to take a security clearance that he clearly does not want. Now listen to me, Liberal Party and NDP Party and anybody else who's out there trying to tell themselves that they can try to bully Pierre Polyev into doing their action. I'm going to say this to you in a way that you can understand. No means no. He said no. 
He's been saying no for years. It's time that you stop trying to pressure and bully him into doing something that he does not want to do. Get back to the idea that the country is in, an, in a shambles, that the security is a joke, that foreign countries only come here and run roughshod over our citizens because of federal governments like the liberal who are too preoccupied with how much money they can embezzle than worrying about whether or not they're going to keep the people safe that are too preoccupied with trying to turn it all into some political angle to see if they can, I don't know what, maybe get four people to vote for them instead of the one that's going to do so because they're going to say, oh, Pierre Polyev doesn't get a security clearance. This guy sits down in the room and for 11 solid minutes talks about how India thinks we're a clown show, doesn't care what Justin Trudeau says. And the first question out of her mouth is, well, do you think that Pierre Polyev should get a security clearance? That's just, that. I guess that really sums it up, doesn't it? I mean, it's not hard to figure out why these countries treat us like jokes when we got questions like this. When our sitting politicians come into a public safety and national security committee and try to make the whole thing about scoring political points with their base to try and instead of asking the tough questions, instead of asking questions that will get to the solution, they try and say, oh, Pierre Polyev doesn't have a security clearance, and that's going to scare this raw organization into, you know, if Pierre Polyev gets this this lame duck security system that doesn't allow him to say anything or, or act on it in any way, shape, or form, but it does silence him. It is a gag order. That's going to scare India. That's going to scare China and Russia. That's going to put them in their place. I mean, they could literally do the thing right in front of him and he wouldn't be able to say anything. Think about the uh, the absurdity of this woman's question. It's no wonder that Canada doesn't have any of the respect from the, from the international world when it comes to foreign intelligence gathering. And then, as a result, how can you blame people for, for telling themselves that Canada is not a country that they identify as being from? I mean, when your country can't keep you safe, when your country is kicked around left, right, and center, I mean, nobody wants to be, you know, nobody wants to be associated with that. Who, who would want to be associated with that? Of course, our federal government wants to believe that the whole world is holding hands and it's all kumbaya and it's all an international, but it's not. The reality of it is, is that it's a very cutthroat world that we're living in. And there are people and factors and players in this world that are trying to do everything in their power to protect their own little patch. And if that means that our patch has to be trampled all over, then so be it. But because we don't have any guarding our patch, because we don't have anybody looking after our outfit, because we don't have anybody who looking after the people that come to this country, looking for an escape from these very organizations. We don't get any of the respect that we require to make these people be concerned to make the other people feel like they have a home that they can they can put their guard down. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.